the eloquence of the corticospinal tract has always been really interesting to me. And one of the favorite exam questions uh, we had in Canada, north of the 49th, was what was the um, what was the function of the corticospinal tract? Is a multiple choice question, and nine times out of ten, the resident candidates wanting to pass the exam would say ambulation, and in fact, it's got nothing to do with ambulation. It's all hand dexterity. Ambulation is subserved almost unconsciously by the vestibulospinal and reticulospinal pathways, and the corticospinal is, that's in, in both Dr. Arabi's talk and my talk on central cord, that's why the hand goes first. But um, I'm gonna finish up this session with uh, just a little bit of reflection, I think, on um, front back, C-spine front back. And I have some personal notes to add to this, but I think when, when you think about subaxial fractures in 360, it, it, in, to a point it almost becomes intuitive, I think, when, when a person needs to do a front back with a couple of exceptions. And leading into that, I wanted to just remind everybody about the instantaneous axis of rotation, a fairly simple biomechanical concept, but I think, is, is so applicable in trauma because if you think about what happens uh, under traumatic forces, the first thing the spine wants to do is to follow its normal biomechanical pathway. And then as the force increases, it exceeds its biomechanical pathway and failure occurs, right? Whether it's ligamentous or bony. But by far and away, most the most common kind of subaxial fracture patterns we see involve flexion and, and that instantaneous axis of rotation is right up here where it's, where it's occurring. And so you can almost, um, you, you, can, you can anticipate that hyperflexion is going to cause compression because the instantaneous axis is in the body, whereas an extension injury, the instantaneous axis is way in front, and it's, so it's going to pivot on the facet joints. So it's... I think this helps helps me to try and understand trauma better. And then the other thing that, that I think is important, so important, are the ligaments. And we kind of heard allusion to that um, in Tim's talk earlier, but it's also interesting to consider how strong the ligaments are. And this is this is a force in Newtons on the on the y-axis it takes to to destroy a ligament. And you can see if you look across the board, the lumbar ligaments, duh, are much stronger than the thoracic ligaments, and the cervical ligaments are among the weakest. Although, when you look at the facet capsules, look at look at how they perform the capsular ligaments in the cervical spine. It's it's almost the same as the thoracic spine. So, a very important, very strong ligament when it comes to thinking about trauma. If you've disrupted your facet capsule, that's going to be an important player. Whereas, if if only the interspinous ligament is at question but the capsular ligaments intact, then you probably have still have a really stable spine. Uh, if we take that a little bit farther into the, um, the axial spine and not just the subaxial spine, we can see here are the ligaments from C2 to C7 on the first row. Look at how they pale in comparison by the strength of the, I'm sorry, the failure strength of the ligaments at, at the atlantoaxial complex with the strongest ligaments here being the anterior longitudinal ligament, and then the ligaments at the occipito-cervical junction, where the strongest ligament is the uh, posterior longitudinal ligament, which is the equivalent of the tectorial membrane, uh, followed very closely by the occipital condylar ligament. So when you think about the strength of these ligaments, relatively speaking, I think particularly in the subaxial spine, you can say that, wow, those ligaments qu aren't quite as strong as the axial spine, but you can see where the major players are. It's going to be um, ligament inflavum and capsular ligament uh, in the subaxial spine. So those are ligaments that you want to pay attention to. The other thing I, I like to point out is that ligaments fail two ways, two important ways. They fail in distraction, not in compression. So if you've got a loading force on your on your subaxial spine injury that's caused some type of compression, you will not anticipate the ligament to fail, right? And the other thing is that ligaments fail in concert. They don't fail in isolation. And yes, there are a couple of exceptions. You can imagine isolated failure of the supraspinous or interspinous ligament, but then if the capsular ligaments don't fail, it's irrelevant anyway, right? So 
clinically important ligament, ligamentous failure occurs in concert, not in isolation. And, and those are two concepts, actually, that I can promise you radiologists do not get. They do not understand that. And so if you're, hel if you're relying on your radiologist to help you make a diagnosis of instability, which is going to lead you on to 360, be careful. Because at least our institution, as I'm going to show you in a minute, that, that's very thin ice. I think whether you, um, whatever classification system you use, and this is just a timeline from the 1930s uh, all the way up to most recently 2020, and you can see where the different classification systems came into play. Uh, I wanted to point out that White and Pajabi had two columns, and Anderson defined four columns. There is really no three column model that's been described for trauma in the cervical spine. So before you stick your neck out and start talking about a three-column injury in the cervical spine, be careful, because I haven't been able to find one. Mm -hmm. um, and then for most neurosurgeons, uh, we still just rely on the old anatomical classification system where you describe the type of fracture and you're supposed to remember what kind of um, failure pattern goes along with it. And I think that even today, this is still completely acceptable. But if we get back to the to the... 360 issue. In my mind, the easiest way to think of a 360, an indication for a 360, is when there's failure of both the anterior and the posterior column. It could be ligamentous, it could be bony, but when you've got failure of both, that's when you're probably looking at, at a 360. Um, we did, a, we did a, a look at our own institution about, oh, I missed this slide. This, this to me was a, a pivotal study, and, and Rick kind of mentioned this, I think, last night in one of the case presentations. But one of the things that we often wonder is where do you, with facet problems, where do you stop with anterior only, and when do you go posterior? And it was um, Mike Johnson, Charles Fisher, Mike Boyd, uh, Oxland, Tom Oxland, uh, who's a bio, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Not a biochemist. A, um, biomechanics guy, Tom's a great guy, and Marcel Dvorak that put together this paper based on their experience. And as Rick appropriately pointed out last night, when you start to see failure of this superior end plate associated with even unilateral facet fractures, that's a high prognostic indicator that you're going to have pr pr problems in the anterior column, and it's not going to be held up by a single anterior construct. Anterior cervical plates are notorious for failing in translation. And, and when you add um, kyphosis to that, it, it's a setup. So I, I think I would echo uh, what Dr. Sasso said yesterday. If you see this kind of pattern, you should be thinking of something more than just isolated anterior fixation. Back to the MR imaging, we, we looked at a prospective continuous cohort uh, study in our own retrospective series. It's prospective. <laughs> The data is retrospective, absolutely, but the patients were identified as they were coming through the hospital. And Mauricio, um, I, he might have disappeared a little bit, but he was, he, he's currently Yen's fellow. He was responsible for this study over a two-year period. We looked at patients that uh, had C-spine trauma. They were cooperative, so they weren't obtunded. And they all had a normal CAT scan. And then, for whatever reason, they underwent MR imaging. And it wasn't because, it wasn't because we asked for it. It was because either the trauma team thought they needed it or the radiologist suggested it based on an impression of the CAT scan. And then what happens is, of course, the MRI gets done and we get consulted. So that's why it's kind of a prospective of study, but, but then we get the data from the charts afterwards. So we're all consulted on call for, for, for these patients. And over a two-year period, there were 33 of them where the CAT scans were reportedly abnormal, but in our mind looked pretty normal except for degenerative changes. But the MRI report indicated partial ligamentous tear, disruption, interrupted ligaments, distraction, attenuation, or strain, reported by the radiologist, right? And if we uh, looked at the mechanisms involved in that, 13 of them had motor vehicle accidents, 11 had falls, three had assaults, three were pedestrians, two were bicyclists, and there was one motorcycle accident. But over the course of, of the study, these are the ligaments that were most commonly invoked by the radiologist as being uh, traumatized. Interspinous ligament, not surprisingly. Ligamentum flavum, 
in, in this second group, anterior longitudinal ligament, posterior longitudinal ligament, and the capsular ligaments. Now remember, this is, this is the subaxial spine. Then what we went on to do is we uh, looked at these patients, and all 33 of them, uh, at the request of the trauma team, were placed on extended full spinal precautions until we, the spine service, could see them and decide if we were going to operate. All 33 of them underwent flexion and extension x-rays, which were completely normal. And all 33 of them had their collar removed. None of them went on to surgery, and none of them went on to return to the ER during the length of the two-year study. So I, I'm, I'm not saying anything about sensitivity and specificity. I'm just saying there's a real issue here if you're using somebody else to decide what's stable and what's not as your benchmark, whether you're going to operate on these patients or not. If we get down, for me, it's still the two column, but the bony alignment is the most sensitive indicator of what stability is and what instability is. And I'll be interested in hearing some of the faculty's comments if we have time. Um, there are a couple of things that I've learned through the years. I think distraction can be important on the operating room table. You can put the distracting pins in a neutral. And remember, trauma patients, at least until recently, ha used to have young, healthy bone. Um, the ones we're operating on to re to perform realignments typically still do have young, healthy bone. But you can distract in a neutral manner. You can also insert the pins uh, in a, I guess, what you would call a divergent manner in order to accentuate lordosis. You can accentuate lordosis too much by putting the pins in too divergent. And then what happens is you can create kyphotic problems at the adjacent segments. That may not be so har har harmful in trauma, but I can tell you in putting in disc arthroplasties, that can be a big deal. And then sometimes, and this has helped me out in a couple of occasions, you can put the pins in convergent and, and, and then open up the back, and, and that can help you get a reduction with a unilateral facet fracture. I really like to decompress. I think decompression is one of the most common indications we do in, in, in doing a 360. And I, the, the understanding the anatomy is so important. It's, it's, it was Paul Cooper who told me that this distance from pedicle to pedicle in the average Caucasian male is 18 to 22 millimeters. Yet I can't tell you how many times I've seen a 15 millimeter uh, decompression. And, and in my mind, you really do need to get to the pedicle on both sides with a blunt hook, just feel it. And, and that means you've, you've, you've completed your decompression through a disc space. The uncovertebral joints, as long as you still have bone remaining on the outside uncovertebral joint, you're pretty much protected from that vertebral artery. It's when you start taking down this uncovertebral bone here that you get into vertebral artery territory. This is what you can see in the operating room with the microscope, and again, um, here's the pedicle margin that you can feel underneath the disc with the, with the hook. And this is where the junction of the dura ends and the nerve root starts coming out. And it's important to remember the nerve root's coming out towards you, not away from you. If you're doing an anterior approach, nothing's horizontal. It's either going away or coming towards you. And the nerve root uh, is coming towards you. One of Robert Spetzler's favorite questions during, during the resident fellow um, rounds he used to do in the morning is, Hurlbert, if you follow this nerve root all the way out superficially, where are you going to get into trouble? And what he's really asking is, where is the vertebral artery? Is it in front of the root or is it behind the root? And that takes a little bit of thought. But the vertebral artery, if you're going to follow that root out all the way it comes, the vertebral artery will be laying over it right in your field. So if you bring that kerosene along the root too far, you'll take a bite right out of the vertebral artery. Um, the corpectomy always, in my mind, starts with the discectomy, which is, what, which is what I showed you on the last slide, making sure to take the discectomy out to those uncovertebral joints, and that's going to give you access to those pedicles. And you can see here, um, I've dotted in the, um, the bony resection of the C5 lateral, lateral element. And this is where the pedicle palpating with the hook would be. So for me, doing a corpectomy, again, isn't a 15 millimeter undertaking. It's an 18 to 22 millimeter width from pedicle to pedicle. And yes, there are epidural bleed veins, Batson's plexus, that can, that can bleed here, especially in trauma. But nothing that a little TXA and a little bit of um, gel foam glue doesn't help out with. It's very important to me to make these end plates uh, perfectly 
um, contoured horizontally without taking too much of the end plate, of course, because if you reduce the uh, stress risers that you're going to place on the cage that's going in there, I think you're going to see less subsidence. This is a case, a delayed trauma case. This was a case of a, a patient who had an, a missed facet um, subluxation and came in three months later with radicular pain. And this was for me showing if you do the corpectomy and put the cage in nowadays, the, the amount of reduction you can get with an anterior cage that is expandable is, is really incredible. And, and for me, this is also an example of why in my preference, if I'm going 360 and there's kyphotic deformity, I'll try and do the anterior first um, because that will provide me with the most reduction. If, if I had posterior screws in here, already trying to get that kind of reduction with this cage, I'd be fighting those screws. And I, I don't think that would be good for the, for the health of the construct. This was the same case. This is the corpectomy at the time of surgery. And then with the cage in, you can see the amount of expansion. Monitoring intraoperative evoke potentials in the patient, the patient did fine. So in summary, uh, I think for me, a 360, the indications are really failure of both columns, ligamentous or bony. Remember that superior end plate is important. You just can't rely on an anterior construct alone if, if there's a superior end plate violation. Evaluation is through CT scan, biomechanics, uh, not for me, not MRI. I know we included that in the slick scale. Um, we had to because there were a lot of people that, that did feel that MRI was important, so it became, it became a waffle point. It became an indeterminate if the MRI was indeterminate. The priorities are always in order. Number one, when it's indicated, decompress. Sometimes decompression can be achieved by realignment. That's also important. And then the final priority is to, is to stabilize. Uh, and the pearls, as I, meant, as I mentioned for me, decompress to the pedicles. Anterior first, if, if, if I can. And then uh, pedicle screws, as we kind of heard about in C71. But I do mine with laminotomies, so I can actually palpate the pedicle and put the screws in under direct vision. And I'm never, I'm never afraid to do a front back front or a back front back as a backup if I don't get the reduction I want. I've had a few cases going anteriorly with a unilateral or bilateral jump facet where I can't get that reduction open and I'll have to close up, go back behind, take the facet down, pull the patient back. But at least by going anterior, I've got the disc out and I know when I pull that body back, it's not gonna push disc back into the cord. So that's just my own experience. Jens, that's what you asked for. I hope. I hope. It's awesome. It's helpful. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Rick, any comments? Do you have a microphone? Right behind you. Right behind you. Decision making and your posterior biomechanics. You've done several publications on this, in fact. Coming from the master. Thank you. I love the um, tidbits and the beautiful pictures on the proper decompression underneath the uncovertebral joints of the lateral recess and the takeoff of the roots. That's beautifully shown. So, so thanks again. Uh, can we switch to the lab and have a life sign of Dr.